fucking ability to survive. You may be seated. Is that not good? What a great way to celebrate this idea of peace this morning. We have a young lady who has now uh, found herself at peace with God because of the Prince of Peace this morning. So good to celebrate baptism with our family of faith this morning. If I haven't met you, uh, my name's Clark and have the privilege of serving as one of your pastors here at Fellowship Fayetteville. And uh, in the month of December, as we continue in our Advent series um, it's just great to gather as a family of faith and, um, and to be together worshiping Jesus uh, with all the noise that's out there outside these walls. I hope that this is a place for you these next few minutes where the scriptures and the person and work of Jesus is made clear for you. And you can walk out of here at peace in your heart so you can proclaim it to others. Well, years ago, I had the privilege of uh, participating in a short-term trip to a place called Delhi, India, or New Delhi, India. We were there to come alongside some global workers, and uh, we were trying to learn how do you communicate the good news and the love of Jesus to those in a Hindu context, okay? Now, we found ourselves in a city of 30 million people in a 600-square-mile area. Now, to get your your head and your eyes and your heart around kind of that space, Um, consider Washington County. It's 950 square miles, and there's just over 250,000 people, all right? So let's just kind of, just kind of a, uh, just to kind of get our eyes fixed on this, just draw a circle down maybe from Greenland up to south of Rogers, out to Goshen, Sonora, and then right on the edge of Solomon Strings, just draw a big circle and then drop 30 million people in there. It's a lot of people. I was overwhelmed. And it wasn't just the people. Mind you, people created in the image of God, but just the urban density, the smells, the lights, the constant buzz. It was an assault on our senses and our emotions. And you can imagine um, the emotions that we felt. We saw extreme poverty collide with extreme wealth, the infrastructure from a utility perspective and a a transportation perspective. I just longed in my spirit to find a quiet spot to be at peace in the midst of this environment. And I found myself longing for, I would find a park or a rooftop table or a corner coffee place. In the midst of this place, I would find these little five-minute windows of what I was seeking in peace. And when I realized a spiritual principle during this season, during this trip, is that um, peace is less about what's going on around me and more about what's going on within me. And that ultimately peace, and we'll see this this morning, is found in a person and not a place. It's found in a person, not a place, or even a circumstance. It's less about our environment. And in the city of constant buzz, I was reminded of this. And so my question for us this morning is, how do you find it this morning? How do you find peace? Maybe more importantly, what is it? And how would we define it? And where does true peace come from? And I've often wondered, too, is that we're so accustomed to noise and clutter and chaos um, and dysfunction. It's almost become normal for us to live lives without peace around us, what would we do with it if we experienced it? Could you handle it? Could you handle what this peace in your heart is and then how it manifests itself in your day-to-day life? Could you handle that? Well, we consider this this morning in our second theme of our Advent series. The prophet Isaiah, as we've looked at, he reminds us that there's a day coming that was prophesied hundreds of years before of this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting father, this prince of peace. And then hear these words. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to hold it 
with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will do this. This Prince of Peace that we call baby Jesus would enter a world of trouble on our behalf and he would promise something the world's never seen since pre-fall Eden when man walked with God without sin. In fact, this idea of peace is so much more holistic than I think we give it credit for. And we have a resource that we use here at Fellowship Fayetteville often when we're teaching very complex concepts. and We wanna communicate them to you in simple ways. And we, uh, we get a lot of these resources from uh, the bibleproject.org. And so we found their explanation of peace very helpful in this light. And so take a look and learn. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. It's not incredibly helpful, and yet it's a lot more complicated than we often consider when you think of the holistic nature of peace. I know I've often defined it as just the absence of conflict or the absence of confusion or at best just harmony between people. Can't we all just get along and be at peace with one another? But this idea of completion, of restoration, of God making things whole is where we're gonna lean into the Prince of Peace this morning. We recognize that our chase for peace this morning 
is often, uh, it often happens at a time in a season, we're all chasing it. In a season where we as followers of Jesus, we actually claim to have the corner on the market of this idea of peace during this time of the year, yet politically, financially, maybe relationally for some of you right now, physically, spiritually, there's something off or not complete. Um, There's something unsettled, you're restless. There's a brokenness about your current experience in your relationship with others or maybe um, even in your relationship with God this morning, be it at home, be it at work or other relationships. But this morning, I wanna give you just something real simple that you can hang your hat on Uh, I want to give you some promises from the scriptures that you can go to at any time over the next few weeks if you find yourself longing for this type of peace. We're going to go to the scriptures and hear the word of God, proclaim it to us, and let it preach it to us. And we're going to see that peace is ultimately found in relationship with God. It's found in the midst of, not outside of, trouble and tribulation and trial, we're gonna find it's experienced in and through prayer. And then finally, it's our mission. It's found in our mission as we participate with God and his mission to the world, the great commission. And so we're gonna start out with the foundation of peace. Romans chapter five, verse one, just a little bit of context. Paul has just reminded us that in the life of Abraham, chapter four, he trusted God He took God at his word, he believed his promise, and this act of faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness, because that is true, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we've been justified, we've been made right, no longer condemned by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to explain this in verse 9, since therefore we've now been justified or made right by Christ's blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled, which is a simple uh, uh, theological word for what it means to bring two enemies together and make them right. That's where we get our idea of reconciliation to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his Life And so a right understanding of this concept of peace ultimately has to be rooted in a settled relationship with God through Christ. And everyone in this room this morning, including myself, you gotta have the humility and the courage to admit that without Christ, you once stood in rebellion to God, alienated from him, at enmity with him, an object of his wrath. And I know that some of you are like, that's hard to understand or stomach, but some of you are in that place right now. It's Christmas season, a friend has invited you, um, but you're not sure where you're at with God right now. And he wants to take you from being an object of wrath to being a son or daughter, an adopted son, a co-heir with Christ, to take you from being an enemy to a friend, and this is what reconciliation is, to trust in the finished work of Jesus on your behalf in the cross for your sin, and his resurrection to give you life. It's the key to reconciliation with God. Now, if you are in Christ and you're a follower of him this morning, good news for you. There's no man, there's no circumstance, there's no sin that can change this. It's settled. It's an objective reality because what God says about you is more important than what you feel about you. And when you trust in Jesus, God follows through on his promise to make you his child. This is good news for this room this morning. It's a settled, objective relationship, and it's the core of all things peace when it comes to God. It's a reconciled relationship. And so that's our foundation this morning. If that is true of you, then when we are in tribulation, when we're in trial, when we are in trouble, we can now experience this peace in Jesus. John 16, 33 says this, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. How's that for a promise this morning? It's coming. And some of you are in it right now. But take heart, I have over 
come the world. And here in John chapter 16, he finds himself in the upper room with his best friends. And all through chapter 16, leading up to this verse, these are some of the things that he's said. He says, sorrow will fill your heart, disciples. You'll see me no longer. You're gonna weep and lament. You're gonna be scattered. Any takers? Rejection, the promise of persecution, sorrow. They find themselves in a circumstance that's unsettled, and the very one that's called them into this place is now causing them to be in a state of trouble. And then he gives them this promise as they stare down their fear of physical persecution, the unknown. I would ask you, what is your trouble this morning? Your tribulation, your trial, where's your need to find peace in him this morning? Is it a conflict, a circumstance, a something not quite right with you this morning? And I've been asking myself this question, and particularly this calendar year, uh, do I want deliverance from the trial, or do I want peace in Jesus in the trial? You see, I like to get out of the tribulation, the trouble, uh, the trial I'm in, and then, then I'll be at peace. And what he promises to them here is that, no, the trial's coming. You have to lean in to me. A few weeks ago, we were in a staff chapel uh, once a month on Monday mornings over here in the FSM room. We have the privilege of having our whole staff team together um, here in Fayetteville. And uh, we hear from a different ministry leader, life change stories. They walk us through a text of scripture and we unpack a spiritual formation principle. And the question on the table that morning um, was when you consider the peace that Jesus offers, what image or visual comes to mind? And then we broke up into small groups of four, and we shared what image or visual comes to our mind. And there were some really, in my group at least, some really good spiritual um, responses. In fact, uh, one young lady, she said she, she pictures Jesus holding her like a lamb in her arms. That is a, a picture of peace. Uh, this is what was in my mind right here. So, not so spiritual, but apparently my wife took a picture of one of my power naps on the beach this past summer, and for me, <laughs> I wasn't going to Jesus, I was going to the beach, all right? And it's a state of settledness. I've dozed off in the middle of a chapter of a book, and I've got lunch in me and some fish tacos, and I'm taking a nap, and I can hear the waves, and that's the white noise of my life, and some of y'all, I'm, I'm taking you there right now, and now you're distracted. Okay, But on a more serious note, there are places that we do find a sense or an environment of peace. Um, this right here is a, is a creek that runs through the middle of downtown Crested Butte. Um, it's in Totempo Park, and um, it's a place for me the last 20 years that when I get to get away and get the scriptures or a good book and read, this is a park I find myself in. There's nothing wrong with a good place to find peace or be at peace in Jesus. In fact, just on my 50th birthday, Pam and I, we were sitting in this park together, just us two um, having a meal together. Um, this is Great in Beach, Florida, and this is this past summer, and this is one of the sunsets. And if you've been to any of those beaches down there, you enjoy a good sunset. It's my favorite time. Everybody goes in to eat. Uh, the Nolan family, much to their chagrin, we stay on the beach from 5.30 to 8.30, why everybody goes in so that we can do this right here. And so I think of circumstance or environment when I think of peace. It's interesting that I want to get out of the trial to find it instead of meet Jesus in it. Peace happens when we realize that Jesus is with us in the trial, and that's part of what he's speaking truth to, to his disciples. I want Jesus out of the trial. He meets us in it. And there's a way that we meet him in it. And this is an old promise for many of you in chapter four of Philippians. And we meet him in our trial through communication and prayer. Um, Philippians four, he's actually about to remind them of how to be content in any circumstance here. 
And this is what he prefaces it with. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, asking God for supply. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, this is an experiential peace. It's an objective reality. We find it in Jesus, and now we begin to experience it in the depths of our soul. It surpasses all understanding. It'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Consider these three images. This is where I struggle when it comes to living this out on a day-to-day basis. I've struggled with it this week. And maybe for you, the unknown or the uncertainty of head, ahead is where you struggle to experience the fullness of this peace or a place of indecision. There's, there's some decisions looming in front of you right now, and there's a lack of clarity. There's a lack of wholeness or completeness, a, fin- a drop your shoulders moment. Whew. I'm glad that decision's behind us. Some of you are there right now. Or this, the to-do list that has different categories, and no matter what you do, it seems to grow, and it's always incomplete, and I struggle with that myself. I had my to-do list out this morning. I was happily the struggler of OCD, marking things out, and then add more things. It, it, it's not complete. There's a lack of peace. It's unfinished. But these are the areas I struggle with to bring Jesus into through prayer to guard against anxiety, whether it be work or family, financial, health, friends, burdens. See, the chaos is not always the trouble outside of me. It's the trouble inside of me that causes me to miss the goodness of this. Now, let me share a few examples, and I wanted to get really practical here so that this isn't just a floating concept and you don't have anything to walk out of here with, okay? So I'm a dad of a senior at Fayetteville High, and he just finished his football season in the last couple of weeks. And yes, I'm one of those dads that thought it would be okay to allow my son, Bo, to run himself into people um, for the last eight years in a thing called football. Like how, that's pretty smart, right? Yeah. And so one of the sweet joys of my life is Fridays and game day breakfast at Village Inn with him and me. It's been one of the great joys of his senior year. Inside my spirit, my heart, Fridays were anxious for me. I was begging God for mercy. <laughs> God, would you get us to 10 p.m. tonight? <laughs> As a dad, you've been, if you're a parent in here, you understand uh, the weight of that. It seems so trivial and small and a silly game. And uh, yeah, He's my son. So I would take that anxiety and I would cast it onto the Lord. Meet me in this, God. Trust you, my son. My son Jacob, two weeks ago, he just got engaged, my middle son. And we love Grace. Um, uh, Going to be another one of our new daughter-in-laws. And uh, they've got a lot of decisions to make, graduation and school and where to live and jobs and all those kind of things. The last two weeks, guess who started to feel that weight for him? You're always a parent, aren't you? I feel it. I feel like I want to step in and like make the decisions for him and chart it out and get a map and a date calendar and say, this, we can do this thing, right? Thatcher, you're helping him with that. That's right. He works with Thatcher. I'm feeling anxiety, sense of restlessness about his future. And so I've said yesterday, I got a text from him. He asked me to pray for him. He gets it better than I do. Dad, I need clarity on this. Would you pray for me? So yesterday, I cast that anxiety onto the Lord through prayer. Some of you have been here this year. No less than seven times this calendar year have I had a test, um, a pathology lab, or a scan to determine if whatever time I have left on this planet in this body is working. Some of that just happens when you turn 50 and you start getting all your checkups and everything. And I found myself, like I said, no less than seven times having these seven to 10 day gaps of waiting on results. How many of you are there right now? You're waiting in the unknown. In one particular scan, I found myself um, laying there, my rings off, wallet, keys are away, I am dressed. 
And I'm in this tube. It's taking pictures of me, places I can't see. But guess who sees what I can't see? The Lord does. I remember laying there going, God, I am completely out of control of the outcome of this. Would you meet me in this place and be my peace? Some of you needed to hear that this morning. Maybe you have a test this week. He meets us in our peace, with peace, as we cast our anxiety, our angst upon him. And then finally, and this is the good news that we have to proclaim to a world gone mad. We've got the answer. And this room should be a light, this candle of peace to a world that needs it. Because in 2 Corinthians 5, he says this. Anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Because of these things, he says in verse 18, Christ had reconciled us to himself. He gave us the ministry. He's entrusted to us this ministry that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay? I've gotten very individualistic for a few minutes here. But as we consider the great commission and the good news involved in that, I want us to, we got to step outside of ourselves for a minute here to, as we close. This is bigger than you this morning, this idea of peace. It's actually not about you as an individual feeling good about all your circumstances. It's actually this message. If we're going to dispense the aroma of peace to a world that needs it, not only do we have to experience it, but we've got to proclaim it. See, the word reconciliation carries with it not just you being right with God, but God's on a reconciliation project or a restoration project with a world gone mad that's broken. And he's actually given you and I the privilege of bringing us into that story so that we can proclaim peace. Paul literally says it. And so during this Advent, our peace with God, our peace in our trial, our peace through prayer should mark us as followers of Jesus. It should be what people see as you wade through your own crisis moments. It gives us the opportunity with our lips, our mouths, our voices, our words to speak the good news that people can find peace from the Prince of Peace. You see, the Prince of Peace is our true source of peace. If you need a big idea, the Prince of Peace is our true source of peace. The first advent, This baby boy, the first advent, gave us the child of peace. The second advent that we wait on, where we'll experience the fullest expression of what peace is in a kingdom way, not just in our hearts as the church alive in Christ, but in its fullest manifestation in a physical way on this planet, a place that we all long for. Between these two advents, we now live. Isaiah prophesied it. Jesus made it possible. Tribulation is its opportunity. Prayer helps us experience it. Our mission is to proclaim it. You see, this baby Jesus would eventually be caught up in an unjust trial. And at age 33, he would be illegally arrested. And the scriptures use the word agony, sorrow, and troubled to describe the state that he was in. You know why he felt that? It's for you and for me. You see, he took on our lack of peace by engaging in a chaotic 24-hour window so that you could have it. And if your trouble right now involves rejection, uh, desertion by friends, loneliness, the weight of sin in your life, being misunderstood by the world, physical pain, Jesus experienced all of that for you and for me. You see, Jesus would take it on. In fact, Jesus ran into it. When we run from it, he ran into the trial so that you and I, you and I could have true peace from the Prince of Peace. He experienced the ultimate trouble, the ultimate tribulation. You remember our verse in Isaiah Chapter 9, the Prince of Peace, of 
the increase of his government, uh, there will be no end. There's a day coming, Revelation 21, where the earth will be at rest. And us as his followers, as his co-heirs, we'll experience the fullness of that peace. And it will be an extended circumstance, what you might call an eternal circumstance, an environment. It's not just within does he reign and rule, but he's gonna reign and rule all around us. And this is how the scriptures speak of it. Saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. I, saw, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now hear this picture. And let your shoulders drop. This is where we're going, church. Our family of faith. This day's coming. Dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And so between the first advent and the second and this day in the future, may you be comforted by the prayer of the Apostle Paul. Would you pray with me? Father, your word says in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times. In every way, the Lord be with you all. The Prince of Peace is with us. This morning, Father, I pray that you would give us the courage to lean into the work of your Son. It's objective, it's true because of our faith in Him. What you say about us is so much more important than what we feel about ourselves. Help us lean into that. God, I pray that experientially we would experience His peace and in our prayers as we cast our anxieties upon you, um, in our trial and our trouble and our tribulation. Give us the courage in the office, the marketplace, the parks, the schools to preach this good news of peace is the hope of the world. And we'll trust you with those outcomes. In Jesus' name.